Good morning. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 8, verses 22 to 49, after Solomon built the temple, he offered a prayer of dedication to the Lord. Within his invocation, he mentions the word prayer 13 times. God's temple was to be a house of prayer, a place for the people of Israel to meet with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But by the time of Jesus' day, Solomon's temple had already been long destroyed for hundreds of years. It was destroyed as a result of gross idolatry. And then a second temple, 70 years after the first temple's destruction, had been built on the same location. But by the time of Jesus' day, things were really not much better than they were when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the first temple. And the text that we come to today, we're going to see the Lord come into his temple and clean house. Indeed, the temple is the house which was built for the Lord. And so for it to be defiled by thieves and robbers in the name of God makes their offense all the more grievous. And Christ's anger that we're going to see in our passage is completely justified. Our passage is Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. Today, we're going to see Christ in a way that few today perceive him. There is a kind of perception. I mean, all of us have it. We have a perception of how Christ is, how he acts, maybe even what he looks like from paintings. Let's try to get all of that out of our mind and see him freshly through what the Word is going to say about one of his attributes today. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are so grateful, as I said before, to gather together today freely and to open your Word and to study it and to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing and wonderful privilege, the corporate worship of your church. Shh by your church should be uh, the highlight of our week. It should be the time that we look forward to every week when the saints gather together and extol you and worship you and learn more about you. And I'm grateful for every single person who's in this room today. They could be doing other things, but you have put it into their hearts to come here today where so many others are at home or partying or doing something else on the long holiday weekend, they are here because they want to know you. And I thank you for that, Lord. And please speak to us now. You do speak to us, Lord. We know that you do. You speak to us through your written word, the Bible. And so illuminate your word to us today. This only book in the whole world which is alive I pray that it would come into our hearts, break up the fallow ground, show us who you are, not who we have in our preconceived notions and sinful minds, but who you are in truth. Reveal your attributes to us today. Help us to know you more clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew 21, verse 12. To 17. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. 
And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. The first place that Jesus went after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem was to the temple at the top of Mount Moriah. And what he found there caused him to be uh, so upset as to react in a way that we have not hitherto seen in Matthew's gospel. Have you ever seen Jesus up until, in Matthew's gospel, up until this time, flipping over tables and chairs? No, we haven't seen that. In John's gospel, it says that he actually went outside and made a whip out of cords. He's whipping these people who are inside the temple. Can you imagine? Oh, that had to be terrifying. He overturned the tables. He overturned the seats of the people. He poured out the money on the ground. Clearly, Jesus is furiously angry here. And I think it's of great value for us to um, stop for a moment and consider this fact. Some of us perhaps tend to paint Jesus in our minds as a sort of milquetoast, feeble, timid hippie. You know, maybe some, some kind of perhaps weak person. I mean, almost like a Mr. Rogers. Not saying Mr. Rogers was a hippie, but, but uh, you know, very sort of only gentle all the time. Can you imagine Mr. Rogers entering his neighborhood with a whip and whipping King Friday, you know? <laughs> of course not. And no offense to him, I, I have nothing against Mr. Rogers. As a matter of fact, he was a Presbyterian minister. But Mr. Rogers is not Jesus and vice versa. And while it's true that 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love, what 1 John 4, 8 does not say is that God is only love. He is not only love. He is the embodiment of love. He is a God who is full of compassion. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. He is abounding in uh, uh, steadfast love and mercy and truth. And all that's true about him. And it's true about him all the time. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. All those things are true. And at the same time, he is good. And he is righteous. And he is holy. And he is jealous for his own worship and glory and honor. He is jealous for those things. I mean, the text says, actually, that God is a jealous God. Now, before you get hung up on that word jealous, context is key. We typically think of jealous as something which is wrong and sinful. After all, Paul commands us not to walk in quarreling and jealousy in Romans 13, 13, and in many other places, we're not to be jealous people. And yet, in the Ten Commandments, within commandment number two, God says, I am a jealous God. As a matter of fact, just don't take my word for it. If you want to flip over to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, let's just take a quick look at them, see the context there. In Exodus chapter 20, just starting at uh, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers uh, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, God actually wrote that with his own finger. 
He says it. He says it about himself. I am a jealous God. Now, obviously, God's jealousy is different from the sort of sinful jealousy that Paul warned us about and of which we are so familiar. Let me, before I even go on, stop and say this. I heard Oprah once, um, Oprah Winfrey, talk about how she had early on in her life grown up in the Christian church and that she left the church and left Christianity, okay, um, because she heard the preacher say that God is a jealous God. And she said, in my own mind, I could not reconcile that with my own conception of who God is, who I think he is. I don't think he's jealous. How could he be jealous? And she walked away. Well, I wish she was here today so she could hear the explanation of what this means. God is jealous in the sense that he expects full devotion from his creatures. The difference between sinful jealousy and God's righteous jealousy is that sinful jealousy is envy over what someone else possesses. But God's jealousy, as it were, is his possessiveness of the worship and service that rightfully belongs to him. Do you understand that? God is possessive of what rightfully belongs to him. He's not looking at something that someone else has and says, you know, well, it belongs to them, but I wish I had it. That's jealousy. That's sinful jealousy. He's jealous of what is his. And there is a right sense in which we also can be jealous. Paul is jealous for his people to know God. I'm jealous for my wife. Okay, she's mine. Something which already belongs to you and the fact that you want to keep it is not necessarily a wrong thing. That's why he says, or that's why when he sees, rather, his creatures bowing down to other gods, he's angry about it. Not all anger is sin. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 4.26, in your anger, do not sin. Paul wouldn't write, in your anger, do not sin, if all anger was sin. There's also a difference, that just as there's a difference between sinful jealousy and a sort of righteous jealousy, there's also a difference between sinful anger and righteous anger. And so we see Christ coming into the temple with a whip, turning over tables. What's he doing there? Has he, has he totally lost it? Is he sinning in some way? Well, we know that's not true. He's the sinless Savior. He's the spotless Lamb. He's not sinning. So then, how do we understand the difference? What is the difference between a righteous anger and a sinful anger? Godly anger is different from so much of man's typical display of anger. So often, we display anger by retaliating due to personal injury. That's always wrong. Retaliating due to personal injury is always wrong. And that's what it means when James says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If, if someone hurts me, they say something mean to me, and I want to retaliate against them, and I'm angry, and I'm grinding my teeth, and I'm furious about it, and I want to hurt them back, that's not righteous anger. It's not retaliatory. It's not based on personal offense. As a matter of fact, we never see Jesus retaliate due to personal injury. Never. Think about that for a second. Even as he is being nailed to the cross, which is the most unjust thing which has ever happened in the history of the world. Because if anyone deserved to be on the cross, it's not Jesus. Even the thief next to him says, we deserve to be here, but this man did nothing wrong. If anyone could retaliate, if anyone had a right to curse the ones who are driving the nails into his hands and feet, it would have been Jesus. Absolutely. But what does he do? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He never retaliates based on personal injury. Now, I know this almost seems like some, something like an impossible ideal. But listen now. And I, I, I preach this to myself. 
as someone who has struggled with this very issue, it is never right to be angry and retaliate against someone for someone's personal injury against you. Never. Never. Say never. How far we fall short of that so often. I'm, I'm just convicted in my own heart about it. And additionally, for us it's possible and even common to allow what might start out as righteous anger to turn into unrighteous anger. See, we should, uh, there's a, a rightness about being angry about the murder of babies in the womb. There's a rightness about it, all right? I'm angry when I hear about the legislation that's passed in New York City, for instance. Angry. It's awful. It's horrible. It's wretched. But that anger can cross a line and turn into sin and bad kind of anger if I then picked up my telephone and called up a congressperson and started cursing at them, right? And see, we try to justify ourselves inside so, so much like, well, but I'm fighting for the cause. And so it's okay then for me to go over the line and, you know, do something wrong because it's really out of a right motive. No, it's not. No, it's not. So easily, even righteous anger can turn into unrighteous anger for us. And that line uh, for... For sinful people, that line is so hazy and easy to cross. It just is. And so what does righteous anger look like? First, righteous anger is consistent with God's anger. That is, it's not quick-tempered. It's not unrestrained. It's not retaliatory. Rather, righteous anger is consistent with the righteous character of God. Righteous anger's focus is on God's honor and not one's own honor. Think about that now. Righteous anger is focused on God's honor and not on one's own honor. Let someone say whatever they want about me. I don't care. I can let it go. Christ forgave me 10,000 talents. I can forgive anybody. But what's happening in the example I just gave, say, in New York City, oh, my, those children are knit together in their mother's womb by Jesus. They're made in the image of God. We don't have the right. We don't have the right to end that life. We just don't. It's not ours to end. It's not the woman's choice to end it. No, it's not, actually. When they say, well, it's my body. No, it's not. God made a soul inside of you, a separate soul. Oh, well, what about the argument of they can't survive outside the womb before a certain amount of time. Guess what? My two-and-a-half-year-old boy can't survive outside the womb without his mother or father. If I left him alone in a house, he also would die. He cannot survive alone outside of the womb. He's two-and-a-half years old. Is he a person? I don't mean to make this about that particular issue. But it is an example of something, I think, that the church, I, I think that it, it is actually the holocaust of our day. And the church must rise up in defense of those who are helpless. That's a part of what we're called to. Very well. Righteous anger is consistent with the righteous character of God. Righteous anger's focus is on God's honor. Secondly, righteous anger is always lawful. 
never breaks God's law, never. It means it doesn't express hate toward one's neighbor. Oh, think about that now. What does Jesus say? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's his command. Therefore, if I'm so angry that I no longer love the person, that is sin. That's not righteous anger. Third, righteous anger is slowly provoked. It does not have a short fuse. Just like God is long-suffering, we also must be long-suffering. We also must have a long fuse, take a long time to get down to the place where I, I feel really upset. Fourth, righteous anger is always controlled. It is not riotous. It is not berserk. It does not fly off into some kind of crazy rage. Okay, so then I just said, the text just said, that Jesus went into the temple with a whip. Is he going berserk? Uh, no. All right. <laughs> Let me just say no. He's flipping the tables, though. He's actually whoosh, whipping people. So is he displaying this kind of righteous anger? That's a great question. Of course. Of course. First of all, we know the Scripture interprets Scripture. So he is sinless. Therefore, we know his anger was a righteous anger. He was angry because the temple was being desecrated by merchants and money changers inside of it. And as for how he reacted and what he did, I'm going to get to that, so keep that in your mind. Why was what these people were doing so bad? Money changers, sellers of pigeons, like, what's the big deal? Well, first we see in our text the, the money changers. Um, drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. So these people were acting as a kind of currency exchange inside of God's temple. Um, the temple would not receive pagan coins with foreign gods on them. Okay, because a lot of times in uh, the Roman world, they, there'd be either like a picture of Caesar, and what did Caesar believe about himself? That he's God, okay? So people would bow down and worship Caesar as God, or they might have a picture of Jupiter or some other pagan Roman deity on them, and this is God's temple, so they're not going to receive the coins of with pagan idols on them into the God's temple treasury. No, no, no. So there had to be a, some kind of a currency exchange where people would bring their uh, foreign coins and they would be exchanged for Jewish money that didn't have those kinds of images on it. And so what the money changers were doing were charging an unfair and exorbitant exchange rate and then pocketing the difference. See here. Give me some... You know, one of your Roman coins or two of your Roman coins, and I'll give you one Jewish coin for it. That would be equal to one Roman coin, but you actually gave me two, see? Think about how lucrative that had to be, since the temple, of course, is the, the center of Jewish religious life. And so everybody who's going into the temple, they do their common... Uh, uh, business in the world with Roman money. And yet, if they want to tithe, if they want to give to God, they have to bring their Roman money to the temple and get it exchanged. They're losing a lot. I mean, this is huge. What a racket. What a racket they were running there. And second, it says he overturned the seats of those who sold pigeons. It says pigeons, specifically. Why that? Because of what it says in Leviticus 5. In Leviticus 5, starting at the verse 5, it says this. This is about bringing sacrifices to the temple. When he realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses the sin he's committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. But, listen now, if he cannot afford a lamb, 
then he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin he has committed two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest who shall offer the first one for the sin offering. He shall wring its head from its neck but not sever it completely. What the sellers of pigeons were doing is ripping off poor people. These are people who could not afford to bring a lamb. They could not afford to bring an oxen. They don't have money for that. All they can do is get a pigeon. That's it. But, you know, maybe sometimes it's hard to, you know, catch a pigeon. Have you ever tried to catch a pigeon before? I've tried. My son Martin has tried to catch a pigeon. And they just fly away. Well, so then what's a good solution? You can't, like, go catch one. Guess what? They have a pigeon shop right inside the temple. I'll charge you way more for it. Who here has ever been to a Cubs game before? If you go to a Cubs game, they'll charge you 10 to $15 for a beverage that you could get for $1 at the convenience store. See that? It's like a one-stop shop inside the temple. That's what these people are doing. Hey, you need some Jewish money? Come on over here. I'll give you some Jewish money. You need a pigeon? Go right over there. My friend's selling pigeons for you. People were coming in. They're robbing them. They turned the temple into a marketplace. It's wretched, awful sin. They turned the Father's house into a den of thieves. See, these men were so concerned about pagan coins, they wouldn't allow them to be deposited into the, into the temple treasury, but they were sure willing to deposit them into their pocket. It's no wonder why Jesus was angry about that. The picture here, when Jesus says that the temple is turned into, the house of prayer is turned into a, a den of thieves. It is akin to like a seedy sort of gangster stash house. A musty basement where gangsters count their money. Can you picture that? That's what the temple of God had turned into. It's wretched, awful. Now as I said, that Righteous anger must be controlled anger. And if you read these verses, you might think, well, is this controlled? He, turned, he drove out all that sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables and the money changers, the seats of those who sold pigeons. And Jesus looks like a madman to these people. Is this controlled anger? Oh, yes, it is. Absolutely, yes. How do you say that, Pastor David? Because Jesus could have utterly crushed all of them with a word from his mouth, and he had every right to do so. Yes. He is so gentle here. So gentle. Do you remember what happened when Uzzah touched the ark? The ark is about to fall down. Uzzah reaches out to grab it, and God strikes him dead. Why? Because he had profaned it. What are these people doing? They're profaning the temple. He could go there and call a legion of angels to come and wipe them all out. Now tell me Jesus is out of control here. No. He is giving them a very, very light spanking. That's it. He only drives them out. Oh, how many churches, I just have to say, as by way of application here, how many churches today are sorely in need of this kind of chastisement? Oh, so, so many. These that have abandoned their primary calling and made God, God's house into a den of robbers. And in fact, isn't that the world's critique of the church today? Isn't that the world's critique of the church? Look at Jesus' critique of the temple is today the world's critique of the church. What do they say? 
Why would I want to go there so some guy in a fancy suit can take my money? Den of thieves. See, because there's bad apples that have given a bad name, a black eye to the church of Christ who live absolutely wretched, uh, exorbitant lifestyles, millions and millions of dollars, jet-setting across the whole world on television. And the world sees it and they say, what a den of thieves they are, all of them. Yeah, this whip is needed now. It is. It is. And so Jesus comes and he clears house. He clears house. Think about it. Who is the temple made for? It's made for him. It's made for him. This is actually his house. These robbers were robbers inside of his house. If someone comes into your house and starts robbing it, you have every right to defend yourself, cast them out. Christ is defending his father's honor here. And then, after he drives them out, we see in verse 14... Jesus shows us the true purpose of the temple. Incredible. So wonderful. Look at verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. What a contrast. Not only do we see the compassion of Jesus, but also on display is the true function of the temple. The blind and the lame came to the Lord to ask for something. What's that called when you come to the Lord to ask for something? Prayer. <laughs> right? Right? When they come asking Jesus for something, they're praying. They are. They're praying to Him. They're praying to Him for their healing, which He freely gives to them. Not only that, Leviticus 21 actually prohibits the lame and the blemished from entering the sanctuary. So most likely, Jesus meets them in the outer courts of the temple in this verse. He goes out because they could not come in. He meets them where they are. They couldn't co come in. Oh, it was Fred Craddock who said this, when I first had interest in Christ, it was because I thought, wherever Christ is, there is no misery. But now I realize, wherever there is misery, there Christ is. Oh, that's so beautiful to me. Wherever there is misery, there Christ is. Here the good physician takes the place of the profiteers. The den of thieves becomes a hospital for the suffering. Here we see the fulfillment of Isaiah 35, verses 4 to 6. Say to those who have an, anx an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. That's it. That's what we see here. Oh, what a beautiful picture of who Christ is. If only those whose hearts were as afflicted as the physically blind and lame would have just humbled themselves and also come to Jesus, they too would have been healed as well. Their inner man would have been healed. But then we see in verse uh, uh, 15 and onward the opposite of that. Look at the text. But when the chief priests and the scribes look at, saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now, 
This is the end of my text here. Please pay attention to the exposition of these verses because I think it's so crucial for a right understanding of who Christ is and of the nature of faith and of the nature of unbelief. The chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that Christ did. They saw them. Look at this. When they saw his one, the wonderful things that he did, and they heard the children crying out that Jesus is the son of David, they were indignant. What should their reaction have been? Um, astonishment? Oh, a blind person can now see. Hallelujah! Amazement? Um, repentance? Faith? Of course, they should have been favorably disposed to the man which did such remarkable things inside of God's temple, which alone should have been proof to them of God's good pleasure with what Christ was doing. He's inside of God's temple. But what's truly amazing and astonishing and surprising is that anybody could react in the way that the, the scribes and the chief priests had reacted. That's what's truly amazing, that they could see this and then have the reaction that they did. Their indignation and unbelief were utterly irrational. This is the, the apex of irrationality. This is an amazing picture of unbelief. Look, a lack of evidence was not their problem. A lack of evidence was not their problem. They saw what Jesus did. The, as a matter of fact, Matthew even says the wonderful things that Jesus did. They saw it for themselves. Their stony hearts was what was actually the problem. What was so plainly evident to the children who came and saw the same miracles, because there's these little children who see Jesus doing these things, and then what do they say? They say what they heard their parents say as Jesus is in the procession into Jerusalem. Hosanna to the son of David! <laughs> right? It was so plainly evident to them. The little children could see it. I don't know, I mean maybe because they didn't have the preconceived notion that Jesus isn't the Messiah. Maybe they didn't hold, no matter what they saw, that Jesus can't be the Messiah. I don't care what I see. The truth is right in front of me. I'm not going to believe it. It doesn't matter. They didn't have that. Jesus says, if you would even enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become like little children. What was so plainly evident to them was summarily dismissed by Jesus' enemies. They couldn't deny the miracles. All they could do at their wicked best is either ascribe them to magic or Beelzebub. That's all they could do. That's all they could do. But they would not see the work of Christ for what it was. Do you know what it was? It was the work of of the Christ. They wouldn't see it as the work of the Christ. Even though all the prophecies pointed to Jesus. And so when they hear the children declaring his praises, proclaiming his identity, it grates against them even more. Ah! He's brainwashing our children too! That's what they think. And so they think it's the, their duty to get rid of Jesus, to rid the earth of him. Look at verse 16 again. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you prepared praise? What did they expect? For Jesus to rebuke the children? For him to say, okay, kids, you're going a little bit too far now. All right. Like, don't call me son of David. Right. What, is that what they expected of him? Their question is actually an accusation. What they're saying is this. You don't really believe that you're the Messiah, do you? Do you? Or, or do you? Why don't you just say it? Say it so we can finally get you. And so Jesus gives them. I'm going to end my sermon with this point here. Jesus gives them 
an answer, which is the most mind-blowing, amazing answer. Only Jesus can do this because he is Jesus. He gives them the best answer that anyone could ever give. Here it is. He says, Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? Now, Jesus' answer is much deeper than we might think at first glance. In the first century Jewish educational process, there were three levels of education. The first level was called Bet Sefer, from ages 6 to 12. And kids from ages 6 to 12 were expected by the age of 12 to have the entire Torah memorized. The first five books of the Bible. Martin's halfway there already. <laughs> He's not even six yet. No, I'm just joking. All right, so Bet Sefer is the first level. You're supposed to memorize the Torah. The second level is called Bet Midrash. This was only for exceptional students, the ones who really got a, a jump on it and, you know, uh, memorized their books <laughs> early and, and got the blue ribbon in Awana, and they would be chosen to go on to Bet Midrash. And in Bet Midrash, they not only had the first five books of the Bible memorized, they memorized the rest of the Tanakh, that is, the rest of the Old Testament. They memorized it. And then the, the third level was called Bet Talmud. And Bet Talmud was only for the best of the best of the best. That are, these are the ones who are going to go on and become rabbis and become Pharisees. These are the ones who are chosen by the rabbis to become disciples. All right? And pretty much all these who are in the temple accusing Jesus, they had all gone through that third level. They're the best of the best. And memorizing God's word, they became the experts in the law. Okay, so they know the law really, really well. And so, early on in the Jewish educational process, in the scripture memorization process, the instructors would play a little game with those who were memorizing the scripture, whereby they would quote a verse. But the object of the game was not to say where the verse is located, the object of the game is, I'm going to quote you a verse, and you have to quote back to me that verse, but plus the one that comes before and the one that comes after it. And so Jesus quotes Psalm 8, 2. Let's look at Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Oh, snap, Mike, drop. What does the last verse in our text say? And leaving them, he went out of the city. Bam! All right. Look it. What is he saying? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. They're saying, do you hear what they're saying about you? That they're saying you're the son of David? And Jesus' response is this, not only the son of David, I am the very Lord of heaven and earth as well. Praise God. Praise God. 
The moon and the stars which you have appointed. He's not only saying, I'm the Lord of heaven and earth. I, I, I'm the son of David. The, the mouths of the babies have ordained praise. And they're giving me praise, which is rightly due to me. Christ is saying that. But also, I have appointed the stars in the sky as well. Do you know who you're talking to? Well, they knew what Jesus was saying. They knew it. They knew it. That made them, them want to kill him even more. What? He would dare to play the Midrash game with us? And to say about himself that what these babies are saying is not only true, but what was said before and after is also true. Do you know the one that we're reading about in this text? Do you see him? Do you believe in him? Do you follow him? If not, why not? Don't harden your hearts like these chief priests and scribes who had all the evidence in the world but chose not to believe. Even still, they chose to harden themselves. Sometimes I think, friends, that You know, in, in seminary, a lot of times in um, homiletics class, what the professors will do is to teach the young up-and-coming pastors that you need to have a five-minute introduction, and you need to have three points that rhyme, and you need to have a joke at the end and a conclusion for five minutes, and include your application points, one, two, three, and four there, and then... Land the plane. I disregard that. <laughs> Sometimes the application of the text is just saying, Amen, Lord, I believe it. I believe it. I want to be upset and angry where you are upset and angry. I want to be restrained where you are restrained, Lord. I want to see rightly what the text says about you and to believe in opposition of your enemies who harden themselves no matter what they saw. Sometimes the application is just to look at a passage like this and say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord! You are the the true Lord who suddenly comes into his temple. Malachi chapter 3. I don't even have time to preach that. Malachi 3. Go and read it when you go home. Suddenly the Lord shall come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. All right, whenever I read that, I have to sing Handel's Messiah. All right, <laughs> All right. because that's like, bam! That's what the Lord did here. He suddenly came into his temple. What does he do? All right, last thing, when I'm just, I'm just going to sing it. Where it says, where he sing, I think it's like the fourth or fifth track in Handel's Messiah. And he shall purify, and he shall purify. Oh, whatever, like that. <laughs> the sons of Levi. What does it mean, he shall purify the sons of Levi? He shall go into his temple and cleanse it. He comes in suddenly. He cleanses his temple. That's what we see in our text. Christ, the fulfillment of it all. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your amazing truth and your love toward those who come humbly to you, your, your healing touch for the blind and the lame which otherwise would not have been able to have access but where there is misery there you are we love you and thank you we thank you for showing us um, just another one of your attributes today the attribute of holy and righteous anger that you display towards sin there are some things we should be angry about lord we should be angry about genocide. We should be angry about rape. We should be angry about 
the murder of babies. We should be angry about the perversion of sexuality. We should be angry about the breaking of your law. And most of all, we should be angry about the breaking of your law that occurs in our own hearts and in our own lives. We should be angry about that. Angry at our own sin. Lord, you say that you discipline those whom you love. And so we actually ask, Lord, even though it's a scary prayer, that you would discipline us if we need it. And draw us back to you. Use the kind and tender whip to drive us back to you. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.